Welcome to the Impact Nations podcast. My name is Tim. I am your host. Today, I am excited to welcome our first-time guest, Frank Viola. Frank has written a whole bunch of books, including Pagan Christianity and Reimagining the Church. Uh, he is a prolific blogger and a fellow podcaster. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing his book, Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom. Frank, welcome to the Impact Nations podcast. Great to be on, Tim. It's uh, really good to have you. We, I, we reached out to you because this book really grabbed me, uh, Insurgents, talking about the gospel of the kingdom and how we need to really allow the gospel of the kingdom to completely transform, radically transform our own lives before we can really even begin to take that to the world around us. So I'm excited to kind of dig into this a little bit with you. Yeah, me too. Me too. I appreciate that. Maybe we can start by you just kind of telling us a little bit about why you wrote this book. Like, what com- you've written a bunch of stuff. What compelled you to write this one? Yeah, well, most of my work for people who are new to um, me uh, is is dedicated to a couple of themes that are not really written about too much. Uh, one is the deeper Christian life. Um, which kind of can be put under the umbrella of there must be more than this, which is my own heart cry and the heart cry of many Christians when it comes to church, the Bible, the Lord, there's got to be more than this, meaning more than what I understand, more than what I've been taught. And uh, so the Deeper Christian Life answers to that. I've also written a series of books uh, a while ago on uh, radical church restoration. You mentioned two of them, Pagan Christianity with Georgia Barna, and then the follow-up, Reimagining Church, and then Finding Organic Church. But um, I, I have been convicted and compelled and challenged over the years to really look at this subject of the kingdom of God, which Jesus talked about so often, um, not systematically, which has been done most of the time when people talk or write about the kingdom. The, the, it's a topical or systematic approach. But I did it, Tim, narratively, looking at the whole sweep of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, chronologically seeing the development of this civilization that the New Testament calls the kingdom of God, and realizing that there is an opposing civilization that Paul and John and even Jesus called the world, or the world system, two kingdoms in tension. And so what really grabbed me when I did that study was this phrase, the gospel of the kingdom. And I discovered, Tim, that most Christians, most of us, including myself, have never heard the gospel of the kingdom. Now, we've heard the gospel of salvation, and that usually comes in two different forms, depending on what part of the aisle you're on, either the Christian right or the Christian left. But what is this gospel of the kingdom? And so consequently, I wrote this book because I felt like it's unique in that very few people have tackled the kingdom of God from this perspective, specifically answering the question, what is the gospel of the kingdom? And it altered my life radically and profoundly, and so I wanted to share that same message with others because I feel like it would really transform the body of Christ, especially in the days in which we live. So if you had to define the, the kingdom or the gospel of the kingdom uh, in you know one short phrase, how would you, just for our listeners, so they've really got something to latch on to just in terms of defining our terms as we move forward, how would you define that for people? Yeah, well, that's one of the mistakes. One of the mistakes is once you define the kingdom— mm-hmm or the gospel of the kingdom, you have immediately drained it from its power. Because what people do then is they try to um, associate what you have just said in a short, distilled, Aristotelian, (laughs) Western (laughs) definition into what they already understand, Mm -hmm. okay? And And so what you find in Jesus and Paul is they never define the kingdom. They illustrate it. Wow. And so Jesus often said, the kingdom of God is like or the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of God can be likened unto. And Paul, what he does is he contrasts it, and he says the kingdom of God is not, and then he will fill in the blank. So what I will say to your listeners is the kingdom of God is not heaven, nor is the gospel the kingdom about going to heaven, and the kingdom of God is not making the world a better place. It's not about transforming society. That's not the kingdom either. 
And the gospel of the kingdom is a message that is so powerful that it cannot fit into what we typically hear the gospel as being. Jesus died for his sins, believe on him, you go to heaven. Now, that's a slice of the gospel. It's a part of the gospel. But it is not the full gospel. And it's certainly not the gospel of the kingdom. Neither is the message that says, you know, God wants us to make the world a better place. He wants us to transform governments. He wants us to engage in social justice. That's, there's all aspects of the kingdom of God and the gospel in that phrase, but that's not what it is. And so <laughs> I want people to read the book so they can get an idea. What, what we've found, uh, Tim, is that people are just shaken to their core. Um, one, of the things that, one of the things that I, it would provoke me to, to write this is, you know, there was a time not too long ago where headline news was all about radical terrorism. Mm and the havoc that radical terrorists, terrorists were, um, were, were wreaking on the Western world. Now, we don't hear much about that right now where we're recording this in the fall of 2020, because what's taken over all the headlines <laughs> <laughs> is uh, the presidential election and then this thing called COVID, okay? Yeah. So it's almost as if radical terrorism no longer exists, but that's not true. It's, it's alive and well. And people, even Christian people, quote-unquote, get recruited into this radical terrorism, and their devotion and their allegiance to radical terrorist causes, when they get into that, is so much stronger and more profound than the average Christian's devotion to Jesus Christ and to the Scriptures. Whoa. And so I had to ask the question, what on earth is wrong here? <laughs> yeah. Why is that? What's wrong with this picture? And so that was the provocation of insurgents reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. So this this prompts a question for me. As I was reading the book, one of the things that really struck me, actually, was you talk about the violence. Uh, uh, and you use violence, the, the word violence, in a really interesting way. And it... I, Honestly, at first, I really wrestled with it. And, it, you know, there's a lot of translations of, you know, the kingdom of God is advancing. Uh, and, you know, some say you need to lay hold of it by force or, or the other translation yeah. is violence. And so when you talk about radical uh, Islam or, or terrorism, things like that, I, you know, my mind is thinking violence. What is Jesus talking about when he talks about laying hold of the kingdom with violence yeah well those are those are two different things and when i focus on radical terrorism i'm not talking about physical violence that they that they wreak havoc on, on the world uh, not at all i mean that's, more that's devotion. evil plain and simple yeah i'm talking about their devotion to their cause yeah their devotion to their cause is unparalleled and it exceeds the devotion that most christians have to jesus christ and that's a problem and we should ask why is that and I come down to say that the kind of convert produced is the result of the kind of gospel preached and received. Mm. It's because of the watered-down watered down gospel we have. That's yeah. why there's such little devotion uh, in the body of Christ to um, Jesus himself and his cause, which is the kingdom of God. But when Jesus said, you know, the kingdom of God is given, taken by the violent, and the violent take it by force— he was talking about this radical dimension of those who will press into him and embrace him and throw themselves into him and his cause and receive what he has to offer in such a desperate, powerful, full-out, violent, if we can use that metaphorically, yeah. way, okay? So like when, the, when you see the woman with the issue of blood, okay, here she is, she's in the crowd, she's unclean, and what does she do? She presses her way through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. She was at a point of total desperation, and she didn't care. She didn't care what people thought of her. She didn't care about the religious taboos she was breaking. She said, I'm going to get to Jesus Christ, come hell or Hiawatha, okay? She was taking the kingdom by violence. Yeah. And that's what Jesus was talking about. He also used the phrase, press into the kingdom and so I do dedicate a few chapters on that uh, on that particular subject but that's a that's a small aspect of the book as, as, as you know indeed but yeah I, th I think that that's what really gripped me was this the violence was really more about uh, 
that level of devotion? Like, what are you going to cut out of your life? What are you going to uh, allow the Lord to uh, mold in your own character? What are you going to lay aside in order to pursue with uh, to pursue the kingdom with abandon? Yeah, right, right on. Um, one of the things I like about the book is just the way you at the end of each chapter you've got this real practical application um, stuff. Can you just talk a little bit about the formatting of the book and why you why you did that? Yeah, that's a great question, and and this is one of the reasons why um, some of the publishers that we pitched the book to when it was written uh, rejected it. One of the reasons was there was just too much controversy, too many statements that were too radical for their comfortable comfortability level or mm-hmm. their comfort level. Um, and you know, they, one of them told me, "You can't say this in a book. You can't put this in a book." <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and uh, and I won't say what it is, but if people read it, they'll they'll get an idea of the radical nature of the message, yeah. um, which, which by the way is not legalistic and it's not religious at all. That's the other gospel we hear the the gospel of you got to do better, you got to try harder, mm-hmm. and it's all fueling guilt and condemnation. This book is not that at all. But um, the the structure, yeah, the structure was very difficult for some of the publishers to get their minds around because your typical Christian book is written in a way where all the chapters are long, and you might have like a discussion guide at the end, but what we did with this is very unique in that it has six parts, Tim, as you know. Yeah. Part one, three different Gospels. Part two, unveiling the King's beauty. Part three, the Gospel of the Kingdom. Part four, entering and enjoying the Kingdom. Part five, our glorious liberty. Part six, advancing the kingdom. And what I do in each of those parts is I write chapters, but all the chapters are very short. They're one to three pages long. Now, I did that for two reasons. Number one, I myself hate long chapters. (laughs) When I'm reading a book, I feel like it's taken me forever to finish the darn chapter, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm a slow reader. You know, I'm not a fast reader. I'm a thoughtful reader. And so when I and I read some of these Christian books that have long chapters, man, I'm just burned out. Hmm. You know, it takes me forever to finish a book. Secondly, the content is so potent, but I want readers to really digest what they're reading, okay, to really mull over it and think about it. And then the other part of the book, uh, along with the, the short chapters, is there's a taking action section, which you alluded to. And after every part of the book, we say, okay, how are you going to make this practical? You just read some some very powerful thoughts and quotes and so forth, commentary on the gospel of the kingdom. How are you going to walk this out in shoe leather? And so what I do is I give readers very practical handles, exercises to actually bring the content to life in their own life. And I feel like this is missing in lots of books. You know, the typical Christian will read the typical typical Christian book, finish it and say, all right, you know, check that box. Here it goes on my shelf, and they go on to the next one. Well, this one stops you in your tracks and says, wait a minute, let's stop here. After all you've read in what Jesus has, has challenged you with and what he's given to you, here are ways you can make it practical, all right? And um, and I'll add another thing, too. Most of my readers, um, the, the book has done very well, and, and many people have read it. Most of my readers will read all six parts, and that's great because they all build on each other. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, building, uh, I'm building a story here. I'm going somewhere. They all build on each other. Well, I've had a few readers, and every author has this happen, but with this particular book in particular, it's uh it, i've seen it more often they'll read chapter one and chapter two maybe and then they'll stop and it's like okay i like chapter one but chapter two really didn't speak to me and they stop they don't go on to three four five and six well here's the thing the readers who have gone on to four and five for example and some six they say those are the most life-altering chapters they've mm-hmm. read but if they stopped, you know, at one or two or even three, they would miss out on that. So I really encourage readers, take your time with this book. You know, uh, don't treat it like any other book where you read it, you got the T-shirt, let's go on to the next thing. But really immerse yourself in the message of the kingdom, do the exercises, and this then it doesn't become a book. It becomes an experience and an encounter with Jesus Christ 
that we so desperately need. And again, I'm writing from my own experience. This is what happened to me, and that's why I put the book out, so others can have the same encounter with the Lord. Yeah. Um, in a second, I want to uh, jump into a couple of specific things that you address in the book, but I'm curious, as, as you're just talking about those who have been transformed by by this work, what what are some of the like practical ways that people report back to you just in terms of changes they've made in their life or uh, severely altering their thinking? Can you list just a couple of practical things that people have really uh, yes, seen yes. transformed? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, a lot of my mail uh, kind of falls into different categories, but one of them is, it sounds like this, I just got born again all over again, you know? Mm. I feel like I just met Jesus Christ. You know, I met him a long time ago, but I feel like I've met him, and I know him better now than I ever have. You know, that's one. Another one is, um, I have finally been freed from addictions that have plagued me for years. Wow. Um, I was hopeless. I thought I'd never, ever have victory over this, whatever it is, right? And they often state what it is, and they come in different <laughs> varieties. But the Lord Sometimes has finally TMI, set right? free. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and um, the, the practical exercises you gave and the vision you gave of the kingdom broke the back of this thing. Um, there's that. There's also, you know, um, I used to be very political, right? I used to either be a nationalist or a globalist. Mm. I used to be you know, really into capitalism or really into uh, socialism or communism, you know, both the left and the right. And and the shift in adjustment in thinking has been profound because so many of them now say, I totally see the world differently, and I look at the political system totally differently than it did before. And a lot of them have been set free because so many Christians, they've invested their emotions in the political system in a particular party, in a particular candidate, in a particular platform, and it's drained all their energy and all their passion to the point, Tim, where they'll just become um, very angry uh, and even you know cut off fellowship with other Christians over disagreements. Well, so many of them have said this has totally altered the way they've looked at politics and the political system. Um, and so they're not on the right or the left, man. They're in, they're in the land of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when he came on the planet, man, he was not part of the political system. You know, he gave the Pharisees fits, and they were the equivalent of the conservative Christian right mm -hmm. in his day. And they also gave the Sadducees apoplexy, and they were the equivalent of the progressive Christian left of their day. Mm -hmm. And Jesus stood outside of both, and he says, I'm bringing a new civilization. I have a new political system, and it's not part of either, you know? And, um, and so we explain that in the book, and it's helped so many Christians who have been so wedded to the political system of our age it uh, set so many free, and and lots of pastors, man, lots of pastors. Some some pastors have ordered the book by the cases to give out to their congregations, and some of them are teaching through it. You know, not only in the United States but Canada and other parts of the world. And for me, brother, I am, you know, I'm just a messenger, right? So I, and and by no means is this perfect. This is book perfect. You know, um, I I wrote it to the best of my ability, but it's so humbling. And it's so honoring to see how the Lord has used the book in people's lives. And lots and lots of young people, too, you know, 20s and 30s. Um, I've had, I remember one I got from a mother said, you know, my 18-year-old son has read this book and has totally altered his life. Um, another young woman in her 20s said, I wish I had this book in high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> my high school experience would have been different. Yeah, so anyway, it's, it's, really, it's really humbling and honoring to, to hear these kind of testimonials. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I love what you're saying, just in terms of Jesus doesn't belong to any political party. My pastor recently has been talking about that very thing, saying, look, if you find yourself at home uh, in either political party, uh, or any political party for that matter, for those who are outside of the United States, uh, you're in dangerous territory, because we shouldn't be at home in any worldly system. Yeah, that's right. That's right. With... With nationalism on the rise in America, are you getting a lot of pushback in that regard? Just, uh, you know, you talk about pastors writing to say they're, they've been transformed by, by your writing, but are others 
displeased with you, shall we say? Well, here's the thing. Um, this book takes dead aim at nationalism in some places, but it also takes dead aim at mm-hmm. the opposing side, yep. which is globalism. <laughs> And um, most of the mail I have gotten was, hey, my eyes have been opened. I, I was wedded to nationalism, and this has really changed me, you know. Um, it was like a, the curtain was pulled back, and now I see. But other people who were globalists and embraced the globalist agenda and didn't even know, you know, yeah. what, what it was. You know, because you could label something and not be familiar with the label, but you can be experiencing and holding on to the reality, even though you may not know what it's called, right? Yeah. So we have a lot of people who've embraced globalism, and they, they don't even know that's what it is. Same thing with nationalism, um, although nationalism is more well-known by its label. But it is, it is, I would say the majority of people who talk about that aspect talk about it more uh, as an eye-opening, insightful look at what they have been holding on to with great passion, and the Lord has set them free from that. Now, I have had a few people, not many, who did give pushback on that, you know, because their their country, right or wrong, you know, <laughs> um, God wants us to love our country, doesn't matter what it does, and we have to give our allegiance, you know, to the flag of our own nation and mm. all this kind of stuff. But most of those people, Tim, have never really gotten through the book. You know, they've just read certain parts of it, and then if they don't like something, these are the easily offended people. And they read one thing they don't like, and all of a sudden they put it down, and they don't read the rest of the argument. So, yeah, but um, but I do talk about nationalism and globalism uh, in light of the kingdom of God and by contrast to the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah, one, one of the quotes that I... I just had to write down with it. when you're talking about allegiance. You said, you know, the the ecclesia that uh, is the only nation to which you should give your full allegiance, uh, which of course uh, is so succinct. And yet, that's a that's a pretty heavy laden uh, thing to say, especially in this nation where we, you know people do pledge allegiance to a flag uh, in schools every single day. Yeah, and 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 just to. So people who haven't read the book don't yeah. misunderstand. I'm not talking about literally pledging, pledging no. allegiance to the flag. Indeed. That's a whole other yeah. conversation. But when when I talk about nationalism and globalism, I'm talking about an allegiance to something, yeah. right? And you know if you have an allegiance to something if, when it's challenged, you get angry. Wow. All right? That's one of the litmus tests that you have idolized something. And national supremacy is an idol for many Christians that don't even realize it. At the same token, globalism, the standard of, well, you know, worldwide governmental organization um, working together to solve the problems of the world, that too is an idol for many Christians without realizing it. And both of these, um, you know, smack in the face of the kingdom of God, which is a trans-territorial, trans-local reality that have citizens in it who live in every country on the planet, and they are not melded together by any govern, governmental organization or hierarchy. Yeah. You know, um, The kingdom of God is something totally different, and, and your quote about the ecclesia is true, although when I use the word ecclesia, and I talk about this in the book, I'm not talking about church on Sunday morning. You know, you, you sit in the pew and you listen to the sermon and you say, yeah, that's the ecclesia. That's in competition <laughs> yeah. with the kingdom of God. Well, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something much grander, much more glorious, much more powerful and earth-shaking, and something that God is recovering in our time. So, um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the statements that I have made is that those who give their allegiance to Jesus Christ truly, not just in pious rhetoric, and and to his kingdom, they give their heart and mind to his kingdom, they renounce both nationalism and globalism in their lifestyle. You know, they, yeah. they're not on either side. They're something other, just like Jesus was. You know, and uh, it's, it's the same dynamic uh, that we see in our Lord. Hmm. Man, that is so good. Hey, in just a minute, Frank, I want to get us down to the brass tacks, the application of this stuff. But in the meantime, I want to just quick t- tell people a little bit about the Impact Nation's 2020 Christmas Catalog. 
Uh, for the last six years or so, Impact Nations has released a catalog uh, giving people like you an opportunity to radically rescue someone from really difficult circumstances, whether that's terrible poverty or slavery, uh, just hopelessness and despair, lack of opportunity. The Impact Nations catalog is a really great way for you to just tangibly bring the reality of heaven to bear on somebody's life in the developing world. Uh, this year's catalog is in the mail. It's on its way to you right now. Um, and I would encourage you, when you get that, flip it open and just begin to read some of the stories. We've got stories on just about every page talking about people who have been rescued from uh, prostitution, people who have been rescued from just utter hopelessness and despair. Uh, there's a story in there about one of our feeding teams during the pandemic who encountered a family that was uh, on the verge of suicide, and yet at just the right moment, God sent our team to go and bring them hope um, in the form of food and then so much more. So uh, check that out. Uh, there are stories of people whose lives are being just completely changed um, with economic opportunity because of the skills and business programs that we're engaged in. Uh, this year's catalog, uh, we've got a beautiful website that Isaiah's put together. It's super easy to browse and uh, read these stories and then begin to give in response to what you read there. Uh, impactnations.com slash Christmas and you can check it all out. One thing I want to point out this year is our opportunity for you to send a card to a loved one. Uh, sometimes you don't know what to give somebody for Christmas uh, and you just want to bless the poor in their name. This year, in addition to e-cards, which we've been doing the last few years, you can now actually send a physical card in the mail. They're going to get an envelope, a beautiful envelope, that they open it up, and there is a card telling them exactly what has happened as a result of your gift. It's going to explain to them exactly how this gift is going to impact lives on the other side of the world. Um, inside the card is a note that you can type up on our website, that note then will be put into the card. Uh, even the font looks kind of like handwriting and stuff, better than my handwriting, truth be told. Uh, but it's just, it's a really nice personalized gift. Uh, and I would encourage you to really think and pray about how you might be able to engage in kingdom activity while also just giving a gift to a loved one and saying how much you love them and how much you understand that they love Jesus and love to give to the poor too. So um, check it out, impactnations.com slash Christmas. Uh, you're going to love it. So let's get practical for just a second here, Frank. Like We're in a very polarized time. You mentioned uh, there happens to be a federal election coming up. Uh, we have Black Lives Matter. We've got COVID. Like 2020 is the most polarized, polarizing year in a generation, I would say. Uh, when we're uh, tempted, when we feel that anger stirring up inside of us for one reason or another, or um, we're confronted with either globalism or nationalism, like what is... Can you give us some some practical steps on how to, as followers of Christ, as as followers of the way, how can we engage with our culture in a way that's inviting them into the kingdom, rather than us falling into the trap of of you know operating the way the world operates? Well, the first answer to that question, uh, as I see it, is. Whenever you become furious or angry with a, a person who differs from you politically, especially if they're a professing Christian, um, that right there is pinpointing something in your heart that you're not in touch with probably, and that is that your political views are an idol, number one. Because any time we would break fellowship over an, a, a political issue or a social issue with another believer, and, and it includes anger, Right, and we're talking about being mad, okay? Yeah. Um, then that reveals that you have idolized that thing. It also it also reveals that you're placing your hope in that thing, or that person, hmm. or that platform, or that party. Your hope is tied to that, because if your hope wasn't tied to it, and that has not become an idol in your life, you would not have an emotional reaction to that. Yeah. All right. So so that's number one. The second thing is. That should provoke you to ask the question, what on earth is the kingdom of God, and why is it outside the realm of nationalism and globalism? I made this statement. Those who have embraced the gospel of the kingdom and are part of the insurgents, 
that's the name of the book, mm -hmm. recognize that, that their citizenship that their citizenship is in the kingdom of God, an alternative civilization, not church on Sunday morning, not a denomination, but an alternative civilization called the kingdom of God. That's where their loyalty, allegiance, and love lies. And it's not part of any nation state, and it's not part of any conglomeration of governments around the world. It's something other than both. Well, that should provoke the person to say, okay, what is this gospel of the kingdom? Because I haven't heard it. <laughs> if I heard it, I wouldn't be tempted to fall into all of this political nonsense, and I wouldn't be giving away my soul to some platform or party or cause that has to do with you know, making changes on this earth through sitting at Caesar's table mm. and pulling you know, political levers um, what is this gospel of the kingdom? What is the kingdom of God in the first place? You know, I was taught it's either this, go into heaven, or I, taught, I was taught it was making the world a better place. I mean, what on earth is it? Yeah. And so that's exactly why I wrote the book. And, and also, too, for your listeners, any of, the, any of those who are left on the uh, interview uh, listening, who haven't <laughs> turned off their, <laughs> their smartphones or their computers, um, we have a supplement to the book called The Insurgents Podcast, and yeah. we actually have episodes, Tim, on Black Lives Matter, social justice, nationalism versus globalism, uh, Jesus' statement, you can't serve two masters, the political system in contrast to the kingdom of God. So even if somebody's not a reader, but they listen, they like podcasts, they'll get a lot of, you know, a lot of um, insight and answers to those kind of questions that you're even asking me on that podcast. And what's, what's happened is many people listen to the podcast. It's very popular. And then they go on, they get the book, and they're like, oh, my goodness, now, now I get it, like yeah. in a way I haven't before. So, but, I mean, again, I'm, I'm grateful and, and humbled that whenever I hear testimonials like that. But, yes, we delve into all of that on the podcast in depth. Yeah, and I, that's a podcast I've been listening to recently because I do love the the practical side of things. Like, how do we how do we live this out every day? Uh, and you guys you guys talk about that quite a bit. Um, hey, I I wondered, Frank, if you could talk to our audience specifically, the Impact Nations family. We are people all over the world who are committed to seeing the kingdom of God come to bear, the reality of heaven to come, and. Uh, intervene in the lives of those who are broken and oppressed. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'll be honest, when I was reading the book and I read, you know, it isn't just, uh, it isn't just, the kingdom of God isn't just social activism or making the world a better place. And certainly Impact Nations isn't engaged in social activism, but we're certainly engaged in rescuing lives from poverty and oppression. Uh, and and we do that unabashedly, and we talk about, we, we like to say we rescue lives with a really big gospel. Um, but I know that the kingdom of God is more than just uh, us being ambassadors to the poor. What, what potentially are people missing out if they jump straight into just bringing the kingdom to the poor? Where, where in their own lives, uh, just based on some of the feedback you've received, because I'm sure you've had people write you who are engaged in that exact type of activity, uh, where do you find that type of person is really touched by insurgents? Well, you know, we do have we do have chapters in the book on God's heart for the poor and the oppressed. And of course, you know, Jesus, certainly a, a part of his ministry was dedicated to that. Um, what I have found in, in, in my observation in my life, I've, I've had ministries to the homeless, I've had ministries to um, people who are oppressed. And, but what I find is that very often a ministry to the poor and the homeless very often is disconnected from the kingdom. You know, maybe I'll have the kingdom wrap label around it, but it is really not an expression of the kingdom. Like, for example, there are organizations right now, um, and this is a stark, stark example, okay, yeah. but there are organizations right now that are helping poor people, that are helping the oppressed, and there are many non-Christians as part of that organization. Maybe a Christian founded it, mm -hmm. but they're non-Christians who are part of it, people who do not bow to the knee of Jesus Christ. They don't pledge their flag to Christ, but they love the poor, right? Yeah. Well, is that kingdom work? And my answer to that question is, in that situation, that's not kingdom work. Is it good work? Sure, it's good work. 
Is it noble work? Absolutely. But kingdom work looks different, and, and that's something that I get into in the book and also in our podcast. We're often asked those questions like, hey, I'm trying to build in my city better schools and better roads, and I'm championing, championing that, and I'm lobbying for it. Is that kingdom work? Well, we answer that question. And so the kingdom is something that it's really an alternative civilization, and the whole focus is knowing Christ, experiencing Christ, and revealing Christ. And a part of that will be helping the poor and oppressed, but again, that's a part of it. It's not the whole thing. And, uh, and what it looks like is, an, is another question that we explore both in the book, and I give examples in the book as well as in the podcast. But it's an excellent question. And there are people, unfortunately, Either they don't really care for the poor, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because they, you know, love their possessions and their money, and, you know, they may give the scraps here and there to, to poor people to appease their conscience, or, or they are looking to government to fix the problem of poverty and oppression. And, of course, we have not seen much come out of that. A little bit, you know, I'm not going to downplay that, but a little bit, but not, not, you know, and the problem is still with us in space, <laughs> you know, but, um, but there is a kingdom way to manifest Jesus Christ to the poor, and there is a non-kingdom way to help the poor. The non-kingdom way, it's not bad, it's still good, but it's not the target that the Lord is looking for. And, and, you know, when people read the book and they get the whole picture, it'll, it'll start to make sense, like, okay, now I see the difference. And, uh, and it's a pretty big difference. Yeah. Um, one of the things you talk about early in the book is you talk about the dangers of legalism and the dangers of libertinism, and then you offer up a third way. Uh, can you share with our listeners a few indications that they might be falling victim to either legalism or libertinism? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, the gospel of legalism, which is rampant in evangelical circles, is the gospel that says God's holy, you're not, try harder. Hmm. And, you know, in, and usually in Christian circles, it, it, it's sort of a bait-and-switch gospel. It's come as you are, all your sins are forgiven, you're under grace, God loves you the way you are, but once you get saved, then it switches to, all right, you've got to try harder. Yeah. <laughs> you got to do more. <laughs> God's not happy with you. You know, you didn't read your Bible enough, you didn't, you know pray enough and uh and so christians all, all over just walk around with this hangover of guilt yeah um and it's fed by many many modern preachers i mean the typical preacher today in the evangelical world will uh, put you under more guilt trips than a travel agent and so you know what we do is we we go into the gospel of legalism what it looks like i mean if you're a christian listening to this and you feel like God is not happy with you because you're not doing enough, if you feel like you're a pretty lousy Christian and you have condemnation associated with that feeling, if you feel like it takes a whole lot to please God and you're just not there, um, then you, you are probably the victim of the gospel of legalism. Now, the other side of that is the gospel of libertinism, which basically says we're under grace, we're free in Christ, so it doesn't really matter what we do. Um, and in the mainstream Christian world, it kind of sounds like this. The main thing that God is interested in is social justice, helping the poor and the oppressed, but what you do behind closed doors, he's not really, you know, he understands you're human, and it's okay if you, you know, mm. <laughs> do things that are immoral according to Scripture. And, of course, the Bible was written a long time ago. We live in a different society. And basically it's a license to sin under grace is what that is. Yeah. Um, and you know that you're, you're – <laughs> you have been – the subject of the gospel of libertinism, meaning you've imbibed it, if you're living immoral and carnal and you're having a tug of war, one part of you says this this is okay, it's normal, it's you know, God's okay with it, God understands me, I'm a fallen creature, but the other part of you is saying, you know what? Something's not right with this. I don't feel at peace. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I really don't know the Lord very well, and I'm, I don't have a beautiful fellowship and unhindered communion with Him, right? So that shows that you have embraced 
the gospel of libertinism. Well, what I found, Tim, typically, this is not always the case, but mm-hmm. people who have been hammered with the gospel of legalism and just burned out because of it, yeah. they gravitate very easily to the gospel of libertinism. You know what I mean? It's yeah. the other side of the pendulum. Yeah, it swings hard. And what I so. do in this book is I treat both. I, I sketch it out very clearly, mm-hmm. the gospel of libertinism, the gospel of legalism, and all of its forms. And then I break through unveiling the gospel of the kingdom, which blows to soot. It blows the soot out of both alternative gospels that we so often hear, and yeah. it gives a brand new message. And the result is, one, on the one hand, it's freedom from the flesh, freedom from the works of the flesh, freedom from the bondage of the flesh and the world system. But on the other hand, it's freedom in the spirit. Mm. There's no legalism or religiosity to it. It's really an incredible thing. And that's what the early Christians had when they were walking with the Lord. Yeah. So again, I, I really like to make things as practical as we can here on the Impact Nations podcast. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to those of us who are making disciples. We're, you know, we're in discipling relationships where we're, uh, you know, we're uh, exploring the scriptures with people who are perhaps newer to the scriptures, newer to uh, walking with Jesus. Because one of the things you talk about in insurgents regarding legalism is that often those who are under legalism are actually going to start applying their own rules to, you know, they get very pharisaical, if you will, about, hey, you shouldn't be watching those movies or, you know, whatever it is. You shouldn't be listening to that music sort of a thing. And how that's not our business to be telling others how to live necessarily. And yet, certainly in discipling relationships, we're trying to raise people up into Christ-likeness, um, is how can we do that without falling prey to legalism and yet continuing to encourage people to, uh, to be transformed into the likeness of Christ? Well, that's a good question, and we could probably spend two hours answering it, but <laughs> yeah. I'll, just in a nutshell, I, w- I would say, first of all, uh, Christians very often are not clear on the difference between God's law and man's law, right? Mm, So most of the things we're told to do, um, I call it the Christian expectation. It's a long list of of don't do this, do that. And you cannot find um, a statement in that Christian expectation list that's in the New Testament. What they are is they're like um, added statutes, kind of like the Pharisees added all these (laughs) man-made laws to, you know, the law of God. Well, that's that's very much in the drinking water of the evangelical Christian church. And so, you know, um, I have friends that, you know, they, out of conviction, you know, they won't uh, touch tobacco of any kind. Mm-hmm. And they feel like it's a sin, you know. Then you got people who live in the shadow of Charles Spurgeon who, <laughs> you know, they, they won't smoke cigarettes, but they'll smoke cigars on occasion, and they have freedom in their conscience to do that. It doesn't affect their communion with the Lord. Well... You know, that's an example of a man-made rule. There's nothing in the New Testament that says don't smoke cigars, right? Yeah. That's just one example, but I can give you many, multiply many, and, and I do talk about some of that in the book. Um, so that's the first one. Get clear on what, what are the standards of the New Testament mm. that come from Jesus and Paul, and what, what are the standards that you have added based on your own conscience? And every man's conscience, every woman's conscience is different. You know, I have friends that... They don't even, they don't go to the movies. They feel like the movies is worldly. Others can go to the movies, depending on what they see, and it's, you know, they have a conscience to do that. There's no hindrance to their fellowship with the Lord. So, so, you know, just be careful that you don't um, put on another Christian what you feel is wrong, but it's not stated in Scripture as being wrong, right? That's one. The second thing I would challenge people, if they're trying to disciple other Christians, right, or you know, new converts or young Christians. The key to discipleship, what discipleship really is at the end of the day, it's two things. It's one, learning to um, embrace and live out the gospel of the kingdom. And the second part of that is learning how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. You know, Paul said, it is not I, but Christ who lives in me. Mm. Romans 8 talks about the indwelling Christ, the indwelling Spirit, and that's who we live by. 
Um, and then, you know, it, it, the great mystery of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, here's the sad thing. Most Christians, if you ask them, how do you live by the indwelling life of Christ? How do you get out of the way and let Jesus Christ live his life through you? Just as Jesus said, uh, as I live by the Father, right, and the Father lives in me, so so he or he or so he or she who feeds on me lives by me. So what the Father was to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is to us. He's our indwelling Lord. But yet, if you ask most Christians, how do you live by the indwelling life of Christ? They'll look at you like you're from planet 10. They don't know how to answer that question because they don't know how to do it themselves. So I would say you cannot give to other people what you have not experienced yourself. And therefore, if discipleship is all about living out the gospel of the kingdom and learning to live by the indwelling life of Christ, then your homework, however long it takes, <laughs> is to learn what the gospel of the kingdom is and start living it out in your own life and learn what the indwelling life of Jesus Christ is. He indwells you. How do you live by him? And, brother, there are resources that show you how very practically, but so often we don't hear this stuff. Instead, we hear, well, you've got to read the Bible and study the Bible. You've got to learn what the Bible is, and then you've got to do what the Bible says. Well, that's not, you know, living out the gospel of the kingdom by doing that external exercise, nor is it learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. The scriptures show us what these things are, but the real question is how. And, and you know, in my own ministry, that's what I focus on, when I hear somebody preach, I don't want to hear what they have to say unless they say, this is how you do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the practical hows, and you, you've you been asking those kind of questions, which is excellent, but that's sort of the missing piece. I mean, most of ministry today in the Christian world is goes from one frontal lobe to the other frontal lobe. It goes from my notebook to your notebook. <laughs> hmm. And uh, and Christians have a big stack, a big, a big stack of big notebooks full of notes and yet the question of how do I make this a reality of my life is often missed. So, yeah, learn what the gospel of the kingdom is and, and how, to, how to live it out, and learn what the indwelling life of Jesus Christ is and how to live it out. A disciple is somebody who knows and is learning how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. That's what it is, and that's, that's who he is or she is. And someone who has received the gospel of the kingdom is learning how to walk it out in their own life. Amen. That's fantastic. Um, man, this has been really good, Frank. I sure appreciate it. I, I wonder, you were mentioning, I think, that people can get a free sample of the book if they're, you know, <laughs> if they're not sure if a three-page chapter is for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, boy, we have lots of resources that are free of charge. They can go to insurgents.org, I-N-S-U-R-G-E-N-C-E, Dot org, insurgents.org, and they'll have, um, if they just go through that website, you know, in the beginning page, it has the book, of course, and where you can order it, but then if you start clicking through the different parts of the site, there's, um, we have audio samples, we have print samples, we have the Insurgents podcast, we have the Insurgents YouTube channel, which is called The Deeper Journey, YouTube channel, lots of messages on the kingdom, and all that's free blog posts, blog, a blog series on the gospel of the kingdom. And so this will introduce people to the very things that we're talking about, and they can go delve deeper even before they buy the book, if, if that's in fact what they want to do. Yeah, and we're, we'll include all of those links in the show notes as well. Uh, I would encourage people to go check that out. You're a prolific blogger. I've been reading some of your stuff recently. You wrote a great piece recently about uh, you know why Christians believe conspiracy theories. Uh, that was really helpful. Uh, and gave me a laugh too, but I'd recommend people turn there if they're uh, if their friends are starting to say some kooky things. That's a great place to start as well. So, uh, lots of really good resources that we'll be linking to. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I write every Thursday to my blog subscribe charge to subscribe. It's frankviola.org, and they can read the archives. You know, we have all the blog posts there, including the one on conspiracy theories. Recently, I wrote one called Don't Give Unsolicited Advice. <laughs> I read that, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to pepper a lot of it with humor. So Indeed. if you're if you're not a prune-sucking Christian, you will enjoy the blog. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, are you working on another? Yes, sir. Um, it's due out in the sum summer of 2021, God willing. It's all about 
how to how to handle and go through with grace and how to thrive not just survive uh trials suffering um crises relational crisis health crisis financial crisis just how to go through adversity and um i wrote it because just about every christian i know brother and, and even myself over the years has been just going through their own personal hellscape mm. whether it's you know relational financial health i mean it, so many christians are suffering and so i wrote this book um with the discoveries that i have made through my own adversities and trials and tribulations and i hope it encourages and it illuminates and enlightens uh, lots of god's people um i test i've tested out the chapters in a close circle of friends and I think it's really going to help people. Awesome. That's great. Well, we'll keep our eye out for that, too. Well, Frank, thanks so much uh, for joining us today. Thanks for just giving us that real practical stuff. I know, listeners, uh, we hear from you all the time. We know that your desire is to is to chase after the kingdom of God, to follow in the ways of Jesus, not in the ways of this world. And so uh, Insurgents is a great place to start for that. Uh, so I would encourage you to go check that out and, uh, and all of Frank's writings for sure. So thanks so much, Frank, for being with us today. Thank you. And by the way, are you from Canada? I am from Canada. How did you know that? I can tell by the accent. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah, the way you said about. Now, the correct way to say it is about. But you have a different way of saying it. <laughs> it's funny because we've we've lived in the states for about three and a half years. Uh, my kids are age twelve, ten, and eight, and I have to coach them all the time because they're already starting to get American accents, and it it upsets me, you know. And so when they apologize, <laughs> I say, "No, it's not sorry. You're sorry, okay? Until you say yeah, you're you sorry, go. I don't believe you." <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, I was for those of you who are uh, very serious. I was joking with Tim about how to properly say about. Uh, how do you say it again? I, I don't know. I just say about. <laughs> there it is. About. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, um, you take care and thanks so much, brother. Hey.